Welcome back. Isn't that a beauty? It's my new Winchester Model 70 and chambered in the venerable, fantastic 270 Winchester. I'll tell you what, I've been asked about my favorite rifles and cartridges for a long time. Um, and I have a lot of uh, rifles and cartridges that I love to shoot and I love to hunt with. Um, I mean, I really enjoy going out with my 32 Special, my Model 94. Um, nothing beats a day at the range with my 257 Roberts with my Model 70 Featherweight or my Model 70 Featherweight in 22 250. Uh, you know, my Model 99 Savage is uh, 300 Savage is a fantastic shooter. There's so many good rounds, you know, and I, and I, you know, that long range bomb, the 300 Winchester Magnum, uh, I, I, I have a, I have a sweet spot in my heart for that when it comes to uh, elk. But you know, <clears throat> overall, uh, I would say that without question, the, the gun that I hold dearest to my heart is the uh, 270 Winchester. Now this is actually my first 270 in the Model 70 uh, rifle. Prior to that I've had Seikos, uh, two Seikos, um, my dad's Model 700 Remington. They all were great performers. But I always wanted to have I always wanted to have a, a Model 70, and I don't think there's any there's, there's any pairing of cartridge and rifle that is probably more. Uh, I don't know. There's just it, there's something there's something special about it, which I guess goes back to uh, the many writings of Jack O'Connor, the late Jack O'Connor, who he was he was the one that really uh, got the 270 going. Uh, you know the the fame that was attached to uh, the 270. Uh, is largely due to the many writings through the years of Jack O'Connor. And um, his writings were not, you know, he, he was not just writing about something uh, for sentimental reasons or anything. He really, he really knew what the cartridge was capable of, and he hunted around the world with it, you know, all, all over North America, Mexico, uh, you know, S South America, Africa, he, he hunted everywhere, Asia, he hunted everywhere with the 270, and although he shot many other fine cartridges, uh, and his wife Eleanor was, you know, she, she really loved the uh, 7x57 Mauser, mainly because of its lighter recoil. But Jack O'Connor really, uh, he really said so much about the 270 for good reason, because it works. It, it just, it's a great performer. There were more powerful cartridges, as I've talked about, uh, they may be slightly flatter shooting cartridges. You can't get much flatter than the 270 with a 130 grain bullet um, on a practical scale. And that is within, within ethical hunting ranges that the average person can take a field. Um, it's got so many advantages going for it. It's lightweight. Uh, you know, it shoots top velocity in a 24-inch barrel. This happens to be a 24-inch. I had my, I had my druthers. I could have gotten a 22-inch uh, featherweight barrel, which would have been probably shortcutting me only about 50 feet per second in velocity, uh, or I could get the standard, the standard rifle, which weighs uh, the sum total weight is exactly one pound more than the featherweight. Once I get the scope mounted on it, this. This is a uh, loophole two and a half to eight power. Uh, I think it's a 33 or 36, perhaps a 36 millimeter uh, objective lens. It's between this and a two to seven. Uh, this is the this is the scope I've always put on my long range rifles for uh, hunting in the field and um, hunting out west. And uh, it's a it's a great. It's, it's a, just a fantastic performer. Uh, I don't mind the uh, extra one pound weight for the, for the amount of uh, additional steadiness that it gives me offhand and kneeling and different positions when you're you know, shooting long distance. Um, it, that, that, extra, that extra weight out here at the you know, front end does help to uh, steady your shots and uh, make you a, 
a little bit more accurate in practical circumstances. And as I showed you with my 257 Roberts, you know, the, the featherweight barrel is not an inaccurate barrel by any means. Uh, I would say it would shoot as good as this barrel any day. But in the field, when it means, you know, holding steadily and avoiding, you know, wobbling and shaking and things like that, especially after you've been hiking around in high altitudes uh, and you're tired, uh, you know, I, I've, always, I've always preferred the uh, standard weight barrel, and that's what I had on my Seiko, uh, which was a, that was a 20, that was a 24 uh, inch uh, heavy barrel, the same as this. When I say heavy, I'm saying standard, standard barrel, not by any means heavy. So, all told, this, this gun weighs exactly 9 pounds um, with the sling on it. So, and I don't have the sling on it right, the, right this moment. But this is a gorgeously executed gun. Uh, it's got um, got sharp checkering, handsomely done, uh, full wraparound checkering in the fore end, free floated, absolutely perfectly free floated, and it comes from the factory uh, glass bedded, or I should say epoxy bedded, two points front and rear, and um, as both my other Model 70s have done. Uh, this shoots fantastic. Um, I mean, this is this is one sweet shooter. Um, in fact, um, when I when I first took it to the range, I had but two loads made for it. I had uh, old uh, 4831 powder that I bought back in 1991. Um, it's an eight-pound canister of powder. And there were always two loads at work with that with uh, every, every 270 that we ever uh, loaded up for. Most of them use uh, 59 and a half grains and um, some, some rifles preferred a magnum primer, some preferred a standard rifle primer because at 60 grains, around 60 grains, you know, that's the break point when you can go into magnum primers. And that's, that's what the factories do with their factory loads is they, generally speaking, uh, Magnum cases that hold greater than 60, 65 grains of powder, they go to the larger mag, I should say the more potent magnum primers just because of the bulk of the powder. So what happened was I just simply ran out of standard rifle primers. I was down to my last 120 or so. And I wanted to have those for uh, loading up some other cartridges. So I went to a, I went to a, a box of uh, magnums that I had uh, just hanging around and uh, loaded those up, and I loaded, I loaded uh, 10 rounds each of uh, 59 and a half grains of uh, H4831 made in Scotland and uh, 60 grains of H4831 made in Scotland. And I'm not recommending any loads because uh, those, those loads certainly should be approached with caution. They're, they're certainly well within uh, specifications uh, in any of the loading manuals. So. Right off the bat, I went to the range and I, I fired one shot at 20 yards uh, after I bore sighted it with my collimator. I have a Bushnell collimator, so I, you know, you stick a spud in the end of it and there's a collimator that sits on the top with a grid. So I had it roughly aligned for 25, 25 yards. Uh, I put it within, it put it within about uh, that far of the bullseye. So I made slight corrections to the rear base, which is this is the Leo, Leopold STD basis, so you know they have a little bit of windage adjustment that uh, can prevent that can prevent having to take uh, too much slack up in your internal measurements. So uh, your internal adjustment. So uh, I corrected for windage uh, with the uh, rear the rear base, and uh, then I uh, made my elevation corrections, and then uh, I just went ahead and started. Uh, I started uh, sighting at uh, 100 yards, and then I fired my first group, and my very first group was a less than less than three eighths of an inch. Now I have not yet chronographed that load, uh, but I expect velocities to be somewhere around 3,100 feet per second or so, maybe higher. Uh, my 24-inch uh, Seiko uh, tended to shoot closer to 3,200 feet per second, so uh, it's a it's a fast it's a fast flat load. Um, and it's a load that I typically sight at midpoint uh, at about five inches uh, for open, open plane shooting, mid, 
midpoint, mid-height trajectory at five inches. That put me way out there as far as I wanted to shoot out to 400 yards if I needed to. Um, now, when I, get, when I get the chronograph set up, I'll be sure to uh, show you just what this does. Now, that means that this is not a woods cartridge. I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be taking this rifle into the woods and uh, shooting a deer at point-blank range, you know, within 20 or 30 yards with a load that sat hot. Um, that's just too explosive. I, I, really, I, I really don't understand why I see people going afield, especially around New England with 300 Winchester Magnum. It's a very popular cartridge for what reason I have no clue. Uh, it has its place. Uh, you know, I, it, it's a cartridge I've used for elk. It does have its place for, you know, for long range big game. But uh, no deer needs to have a 300 Winchester Magnum that just simply uh, eviscerates the uh, animal and, and ends up bloodshotting, you know, uh, acreage of meat. You don't need to do that. Uh, and the same thing with the 270 Winchester. The fact that it's a, um, the fact that the 270 is a 306 size case uh, belies its actual, ma you can legitimately say it's magnum performance. Um, when, you have a, when you have a cartridge that shoots standard hunting loads, you know, game loads, 130 grain bullet and 140 grain bullets at uh, 3,000 plus feet per second, that's, that's magnum velocities by, by very definition. So, you know, at 3,200 feet, 31 and 3,200 feet per second with a 130 grain bullet, you're definitely in magnum velocity class. And it does the same sort of damage. You can't, you can't minimize the fact that that sort of velocity at close range is going to do significant amount of damage to whatever game you shoot. And that's, that's sort of the price you have to pay if you happen to get a you know, shot at a mule deer at 75 or 80 yards out in the, in the plain someplace. Uh, that's just one of the things you're going to have to live with. But it, it, comes, with, it comes as a price for, for having those shots that you can take out to 350 plus yards. Um, so, the options are many, you know, if you're, if you're not a hand loader, uh, what, the traditional, what the traditional solution was, was simply to get 150 grain loads. Remington and Winchester used to make a, uh, I think it was a 20, 2750 uh, foot per second load with 150 grain bullets, and uh, they, were, they were round nose bullets, they were specifically made for, for uh, up close uh, shooting, and they had basically the same uh, ballistics as the old 150-grain uh, military load, about 2750. So that's a very, very good load to substitute for, for woodland hunting if you want to bring your 270 afield. So it does not have to be strictly a plains game rifle. Um, that's one option. If you're a hand loader, you can simply take 130-grain bullets, which is a fantastic sectional density, it's, o it's over 240 sectional density, which is right there exactly where you want it. As I described in another video, watch my video on uh, sectional density. Sectional density of 0 0.240 in the 240s is absolutely ideal for a uh, medium-sized game. And with stout bullets that are made these days, like the Nosler Acubond, things like that, I mean, you really can take you really can take, uh, you know, a much larger game caribou with 130. I still prefer the 150s for um, for a large game, really large game, you know, elk and moose like, or even 160s. But those are the options. So you can load down the 130 and uh, have the great sectional density that you want. And if you load it down to 2,700 feet per second, 2,750 or so, you can have a good woodland uh, cartridge is still is, is still very flat shooting. It'll still get way out there. You still got the same velocity components that you'll find in the 6.5 Creedmoor. If you look at if you look at the velocities that you have in a 6.5 Creedmoor with similar sectional densities, you're talking 27, 2800 feet per second. So, you know, you, you basically can have yourself a uh, the same the same type of ballistics as you would have in the Creedmoor with a little bit a little bit bigger diameter bullet. That's about the only difference. Great accuracy with these guns. Um, 
not just the rifle but the cartridge itself. Uh, it may not have it may not have the uh, it may not have the inherent accuracy that some cartridges have across the board with all the different powder weights and, and all the different uh, types of powder that could be used by some cartridges. But you know it's it's a it's a rifle that has many good powders going for it. You know for the the two forty eight thirty ones and you can't you can't mix up the loads they're different you know IMR and H forty eight thirty one and the same with the uh, Hodgdon and IMR series forty three fifties there's reload of nineteen reload of twenty two there's so many that there's so many that work very very well with this rifle so what we're going to do is we're going to take this out to the range and we're going to show you just what this rifle can do so see you out there. Now I'm going to be loading up 40 rounds, so I'm going to use these brand new Starline cases. I just purchased 250 of them from Starline that I'll be sharing with my buddy. I'm going to clean out those flash holes using a flash hole uniforming tool, clean out the burrs. Then I'm going to run them through the uh, sizing die to uh, true them up and uh, just scuff off the ends with the uh, case trimmer and bevel the insides and chamfer the outside just lightly to prepare them and I'm going to be using the Hornady handbook because I'm using Hornady bullets and it's always very good to use the same data from the manufacturer because that way you make sure that your pressures are in line. Now this is the 270 data that uh, is in my 8th edition manual and if I run down through the uh, list here, you can see H4831, which is a powder I'm using. Now, they list 62 grains as a maximum load. Uh, I, I'm almost positive that I would never be able to load 62 grains of the uh, old uh, 4831 that I have that goes back to uh, 1991 when I purchased it. And uh, I have loading data that I'm just consulting for, for uh, reference. It goes back to 1989. In this particular old uh, lot of powder, I was deriving velocities way up into the 3200s with a 24-inch barrel. And uh, the reason I have, it, even though it was a very accurate load, uh, that, that pink denotes that there were a little bit, little bit of heat going on there. The pressures were indicating uh, a little bit higher than I wanted. This was a little bit more normal, and I was getting still good velocities, 3150, with a different powder. Uh, and that's this particular powder right here that I'll be loading. First thing I'll do is uh, lightly lubricate the cases. I like using Lee lubricant because it's an industrial uh, metal forming lubricant and uh, it's, it's non-sticky. Uh, it cleans off with water. I uh, just apply very, very little with your fingertips and uh, never apply any to the case shoulders so that you prevent any dents. And that's followed up by just a very light lubrication of the inside of the case mouth with uh, this brush here. Just very quickly run them through. Doesn't take too much uh, to get those lubricated. Just to prevent squawking of the uh, die. And here it is, uh, just uh, running them through. And again, they're ready to reload uh, right out of the box, but it's much better if you true them up and make sure that they're uh, ready to go. Now this is my Forster bench mounted case trimmer and all I'm doing here is just barely lightly uh, just scuffing the ends of the cases. All I'm wanting to do is just uh, brighten the ends of the cases and that takes uh, into account any uh, irregularities or lack of squareness and it trues them up. Followed up by my old, this is a 1970s uh, Wilson case chamfering and uh, deburring tool. And uh, that's, that's just beveling the insides very lightly. The process here is not removing brass so much as it is just to, just to just clean them up. You don't, want to be, uh, you don't want to be sharpening your cases. And that's followed by the Lyman flash hole uniformer. Now all this does, it's a one-time operation only on a case, just when they're brand new or if it's never been done before. It's suggestive for the length of the case, the inside, and all you're doing is just removing the chip just the chips around the uh, edge of the flash hole to provide more uh, clearance for the flash and uh, provides a more uniform ignition from one case to another. Now we're using an old 
tool called the, uh, that's, that's a hand priming tool that Lee has been making long before other companies started uh, using the same sort of design. I think this was patented for quite a while. And I've had this from the 70s, and uh, it's loaded many thousands of cases. I like the way it, uh, it, it just pumps those primers in with the feel of your finger, the feel of your thumb, and you can feel that anvil squeeze right into position uh, very uniformly. It's the, it's the sort of tool of choice for uh, bench rest shooters. There's no more, there's no more accurate way uh, to do this. Be sure to wear glasses. And that's that uh, eight pound bottle of 4831 that I bought in 1991 for an elk, uh, for, I should say for a, a mule deer and antelope hunt out in Wyoming. It's a very coarse powder. So as a result, uh, it, can't, uh, it can't be metered very, very easily with a uh, measure like this. So rather than uh, trying to, uh, it, it, it cuts off each grain every time you uh, run it through. So uh, rather than having difficulties, I'm going to be uh, using the trickler and uh, dispense it directly into the pan and trickle it up to weight. The process is very, very quick. In fact, I think this is, this is quicker than using one of those expensive machines. And then you'll notice that I'm using a uh, drop tube. Now that drop tube will stack the powder uh, more compactly in the case and prevent having to uh, compress the loads with your uh, bullet, which I, I, don't, I don't like compressed loads. So in this, uh, with this device here, uh, it very, very nicely uh, flows that powder right down into the funnel and stacks them up. That's followed up by what I consider a mandatory process, uh, lighting the cases and looking at each individual case going right along, making sure that they're all filled uniformly and there's no mistakes. And here's the uh, 270 caliber and uh, these beautiful bullets. I've never actually used these in the 270. I've used them in many other calibers before, but uh, I'm going to try it in the 270. And I showed you that group. It works. It's a uh, it's a great shooting bullet. Uh, it's also a good performer on game. It's a good strong bullet. Uh, that's uh, even though it's only a cup and cup and draw style uh, jacketed bullet, it's very very stoutly constructed. And uh, I have them seated now uh, just to the base of the cantaloupe. So uh, with, that, with that pointed shape that Hornady uses, it's not, it's not easy to uh, reach the rifling. So actually, these are back from the rifling quite a bit. And the whole thing is finished up by just uh, cleaning them up by hand. Because these are waterproof now, after they're loaded, they're completely waterproof. And I could just wash them in soapy water. But uh, this is a labor of love. I'll mark these. Uh, I'll mark the label, so I know what I have for future reference. It amazes me sometimes how uh, how old a box of ammo is that I find on the shelf, and fix that uh, label right in my box there, so I can find it later on. Well, here we are at the range, and uh, it's a lot better day temperature-wise than it was yesterday. Yesterday it dropped down to about uh, the low teens. Uh, in fact, it was eight degrees in the morning when I got up. But right now it's in, the, it's in the high 40s, might even be 50 degrees, but it's murky as you can see. So um, I expect that uh, probably have a little bit of mirage issue today uh, with this kind of moisture in the air, because uh, that's mirage is basically the, you know, the refraction of the image in front of the scope. And just, just so you know, Mirage is, uh, doesn't all just come off the barrel from the barrel heat. It comes out of the end of the barrel. That's, that's one of the things that uh, plagues uh, bench rest shooters a lot is the, the heat coming out of the barrel from that tube uh, really creates a lot of Mirage, especially after the shots are fired. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do something here to uh, illustrate uh, a test. Since I did my last shooting with this gun, I uh, cleaned it. I used no bore brush on it. Uh, this, is, this is a really smooth bore, so I just, I just cleaned it with uh, mineral spirits and uh, cotton patches, just uh, 
four or five cotton patches with mineral spirits and dried it out. And then I, I lightly oiled it and then followed up by a dry patch. So the, the bore has been uh, protected uh, with, with some oil. So that can create issues with um, the first cold, clean shot. So we're going to see what we're going to see what the results of that uh, can be in this rifle. Um, it's been my experience that uh, it's greatly it's greatly mitigated by having a, a free floated barrel and uh, a good a good bedded receiver. In this case, we've got both. So uh, those those issues tend to um, favor uh, cold clean bore instances, but you can still expect that first shot, especially the first shot, sometimes the first two shots to be out of the group, so to speak. But you know, on a practical level, you have to keep the barrel clean, and it's very, it's very well advised to, uh, especially with a, with a blued steel gun, to uh, keep it, uh, you know, a light, a light wipe of oil inside to uh, prevent any corrosion issues, especially to the chamber. So. Uh, and which is always, you know, the chamber is always dried out before you shoot. So <clears throat> that's uh, that's the practical uh, necessity, and uh, that that can create that can create issues with some rifles if you're shooting very long range shots uh, hunting. So I've got my uh, I've got the loads that I made up yesterday, and these are 130 grain flat base uh, interlock bullets, and. Uh, so far, I've had great, uh, great accuracy with them. I have not, I have not seated the bullet to uh, touch the rifling or anything. I actually, I just seated it as far out as I could, still being at the base of the cantaloupe. You can see the uh, no particular seating depth issue. I just wanted to see how it would shoot uh, on natural, you might say. In other words, if I were to buy, I'm going to fire three shots in that first, uh, is the center of that uh, paper. And if I'm if I'm not mistaken, uh, after I after I did my last uh, shooting, I made an I, I made a scope adjustment without uh, without I didn't have any ammo to check it, but uh, I did a scope adjustment, bringing the uh, scope two clicks that would be half inch to uh, the left, and I su I suspected it may be uh, dead center uh, horizontally, and as far as uh, as as far as uh, elevation goes, it should be somewhere around inch and three-quarter high, I believe. So let's see where the first one lands. And uh, I've got to get my hearing protection on, otherwise I'm going to be greatly surprised. Now I've got a target, uh, I've got a, the uh, target set up at 100 yards, and I've got a camera down there to uh, catch the shot. So let's see what happens. Uh, uh, Control feed. I love this trigger. It's the Winchester's uh, MOA trigger. It's got no backlash at all. Certainly a good, uh, certainly a good game load. 
So that's it. Maybe I'll, before I leave, I'll stand up and do a little bit of uh, old-fashioned offhand shooting. Turn this power down just a little bit. All right, there's a steel plate over there. Let's see what happens. That's one. Lots of fun. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and tell your friends about us. Benny's doing great, by the way. God bless.